The first meeting of communities and housing committee to be conducted through the Microsoft Teams platform and possibly the first and last one chaired from a living room in South Uist. Uh, <laughs> I would ask to please turn off your microphones and cameras before we begin and I will ask Councillor John Mackay to lead us in prayer. Oh Lord our God we thank thee that we can call upon thy name on this morning and you because you know, thou knowest all things and there is nothing written from thee, and we pray that thou would guide us, that we would seek thy wisdom in all our doings as a counsel. And we pray, Lord, that thou would come in a day of thy power amongst us as homes, as families, as communities, and that we would call upon the name of the one who died for us, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And we pray that we would have the spirit of prayer in our hearts, and uh, at, uh, we admit, Lord, that we come short, far short of thy glory. But the word tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, shall cleanse us from all sin. We pray that thou would bless us and that thou would keep us on this uh, day anew. We thank thee that thou knowest the beginning from the end. Thou art the Alpha and the Omega, and there is nothing hidden from thee. And we pray, we pray Lord, that we would set the Lord before us in all our doings, and that we would give us the wisdom to do our business here. And we pray for all those who are laid low at this time who cannot be with us. We pray for the chairman, and we pray that they would be with him. And we pray for our chief executive and all the officers uh, who have the duties and the responsibilities at this time. And we pray for all the members that, the oh Lord, we thank thee that we can call upon thee in all our situations, thou knowest all things. We pray that thou would bless Paul at this time as chair, and that thou would be with us all, and that we would seek thee, and seek thy face at all times, because thou hast given us thine only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him would have everlasting life. Help us, Lord, to pray. Help us to be on our knees and calling upon thy name. We ask these things in Jesus' name, and for his sake. Amen. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, this is the same said that I've seen a few bereavements recently in the few years, so I might be thinking of them just thinking of them at this moment. Um, in regard to the conduct of the meeting, a reminder of the following points. Please ensure your camera and microphone are off. This assists with broadband connectivity and also prevents background noise. I will call on the relevant officer to present the report. And if a member or an officer wishes to ask a question or raise a point, please do so using the raise your hand function on your device. Um, I will invite each member in the queue to speak, and at that point, please switch your mic and camera on. Your device should be positioned so that your image is clear and the other participants are, um, please speak clearly and concisely directly at the camera. When called for agreement of the recommendations at each item, a no show of raised hands will be taken as indication of the committee's approval. In regards to declarations of interest, members are reminded of the protocol. You must leave the meeting by the ending of the call, which will be confirmed by the moderator to the chair. And following consideration of the item, you will be invited back into the meeting by the moderator. Please ensure that you're available to accept the invite to rejoin. Finally, a reminder that the meeting is not being streamed live. However, be aware that it is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Collier's website following the meeting. Uh, item one of the agenda is the minute of the meeting of the civic government licensing panel of 12th August 2020, and that's for noting. 
any comments? No, okay, that's noted. Uh, item two, a uh, declaration of interest. Members are asked to declare any interest that they may have in any items in the agenda, and it will be helpful if members explain why they are declaring an interest in the items concerned. Is anyone wishing to declare an interest? Okay, I think that is a note. Um, next up, item three, and that's the performance management 2019-20 uh, quarter one review, and that's report for the director for communities. And this reports for noting and provides an overview of the community's director of business plan and related performance issues for quarter one. Um, the director for communities will speak to the report and answer any questions. Director. Thank you, Chairman. The report is at agenda item 3A on your iPads and it deals, as the Chair said, with quarter one. Happy to report in quarter one that 89% of actions are on track. One action is requiring monitoring around the scheme of assistance. 90% uh, of that action is, however, complete. It is anticipated that it will be finalised in quarter two. Uh, the main service areas for the committee are consumer and environmental services and housing. Uh, consumer and environmental services, the main focus in quarter one uh, was around you know, the COVID regulations and the COVID pandemic. Uh, the service had 300 inter interventions and actions with business and community organisations over that period. Happy to report that most businesses and community organisations were highly compliant with the regulations and, and the service only uh, didn't really have to deal in a heavy handed manner uh, with any local business, which is, is very positive. Uh, housing is outlined at 6.1. Uh, that outlines the key activity on the affordable housing programme. Quarter one obviously coincided with uh, the lockdown. So unfortunately, the programme came to a halt in, in, in quarter one. Uh, with return to with re construction return towards the end of June, the key impact in the service uh, was in regard to the homelessness service. Uh, but the service continued uh, and delivered with amended processes, uh, which allowed the protection of staff and clients. Uh, financial performance is to budget uh, for quarter one. Uh, in summary, then, the key issue over quarter one was the COVID-19 pandemic. Our services had to re adjust rapidly to a new working environment and to deliver services through new approaches and new channels. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank all departmental staff and pay tribute uh, to how well they coped over the period. Uh, they reacted in a highly disciplined manner to the challenges of the pandemic uh, and the lockdown. So I would like to pass my thanks on to them. Happy to take uh, any questions on that, Chairman. Chairman, can anybody hear me? Chair, I think you're on mute. Hello? Yeah, sorry, I was still on mute there. Yeah, I'd just like to echo those comments. Uh, I think just, uh, I think the staff and the officers responded remarkably well to the situation. And the first hand up I see is Ray McKenzie. So Hello. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's two or three points I wanted to raise on this uh, uh, item. Uh, first of all, it's just a, a question on the final number of houses at McKenzie Park. Can you can you give me a figure on that? Um, and what is the position uh, regarding the 25 million that, that was awarded from the Scottish government? Um, are we going to meet this or have there been extensions due to COVID? And what is the current position? Um, and finally, the figures under 9-1 finance, I don't know if we reached that yet, but uh, because obviously I don't have my, uh, I can't see the document at the same time. But um, the figures seem to be wrong where it says 376, uh, not 1130 for community and housing, and 2509 instead of 596 for transportation. Um, these figures seem to be, I don't know why, um, they seem to be transposed or omitted or changed or something. Um, anyway, uh, I don't know if you've got a note of the questions I've asked, but I can repeat them if necessary. 
Thank you. I do, Chairman. Thanks. Uh, just to uh, address the, 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 the questions, uh, the 25 million, yes, we are on target to expend uh, all, all that. Uh, we are, uh, in fact, going to be ahead of that target of all the projects in the programme at this stage, uh, work to plan. Uh, the Scottish Government are going to be extending uh, the, the, the programme. Uh, that will be an extension across the whole of Scotland, you know, to take into account, you know, the impacts of the lockdown, the shutdown, and the distancing measures that the construction industry has to put in place over the next period. So we're very positive in regard to the expenditure of, of that 25 million. Uh, in regard to financial performances, yes, I'm just noticing that there has been uh, some transposition of, of figures there in the table at 9.1. Uh, what I'll do subsequently, Chair, is just uh, re-edit these figures uh, into the, the correct figures and uh, recirculate the, the document to the committee. Uh, perhaps I would ask uh, Ian Watson, Housing Services Manager, just to give us uh, a view on the final figure for houses at Mackenzie Park. Ian? Uh, thanks, Kami, and uh, good morning, Chair. Thank you. Um, I don't have the exact figures in front of me just now. I think it's in the region of 120 or so units have been developed, uh, and that's been over several phases since 2012 when the, the first development was done. I'll double check the figures and I'll get back to Councillor McKenzie with the, the, the exact number, and I'll also see if I can get the breakdown of the different phases that we went through to develop the site. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, that's good. Thanks, Leader. What do you today? Yeah, uh, thank, thank you, Paul. Uh, just a couple of comments on, on what Colm Ian has said there. First of all, the housing, um, it's really, really encouraging and good to know that we're on track for the 25 million. I do recall that when we were when we were given the 25 million, there was a bit of trepidation around the challenges, uh, but uh, many of us saw it as a great opportunity. So I'm delighted that Colm Ian's confirming that his team have stepped up and in fact delivered. The other thing I wanted to mention briefly was to pay tribute to um, Colin Fraser and his team, because every time I've engaged with them since COVID-19 began, they've been very, very helpful and accommodating, and particularly Maura McNeil, who has gone out. Uh, every time I've asked her to intervene or give advice to a local business, she's been really uh, uh, helpful and very pragmatic and very helpful. Well done to Colin and his team, and I, I, I would like you to pass that on. Um, call me in. Thank you. Thank you for that, Roddy. You didn't ask much. Appreciate it. Councillor uh, Callum McMillan. The microphone's off, Callum. Maybe a couple of seconds. There we go. Thank you, Chairman. I'm I'm having difficulty connecting here. I'm on, I'm on, I was on the iPad, but then it, it went off. I was going to declare an interest in the next item, but then I lost connectivity. My wife works in the Economic Development Department, so I was going to remove myself from the meeting for that item. So, but uh, the, the only comment I would make, and make on this is that the, the ship, when it was agreed, had a 60-40 split. So we're still having to, to to do some work to achieve that that split. So that, that that's something for the future. But uh, uh, any houses are better than no houses, irrespective of where they are. Although on a locational basis, I would prefer to see more in the rural areas and more in Harris and particularly Euston Barra. But that's that's an observation. But uh, if we can spend money and get money into the economy, every penny that is spent <coughs> good. Thank you, Chairman, and I shall uh, remove myself from the meeting for the next item. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. Um, Councillor Callum McLean. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, can I go back to the question that uh, Councillor McKenzie had about Mackenzie Park? Is it possible for us, for the councillors, to ha get an indication when units, when housing developments such as, as Mackenzie Park, and we're going to have the Blackwater coming up soon, if we could get the makeup of the, the the families within these units. In other words, within 120 units or in, in Mackenzie Park, 
could we find out if there's two houses, three houses, what is the, the, the makeup of them? In other words, what families are in them? Is uh, what are we what are we putting into the what are going into these houses? Because uh, certainly when units go up, as is the case in Mackenzie Park, as the case in Tolsta or in in, in Laxdale, uh, uh, it would be good for us to know the constitution of these houses, i.e. I, I, the, the, the number of families, the family units that are in there. Because much much debate has been going on already about the likes of Mackenzie Park and the facilities that are there within Mackenzie Park. Is it appropriate for the likes of families that are, if there is families in there? And I haven't a clue. I don't know if, if, if you, Chair, have any clue or do any of the other councils have a clue of what is the constitution of, of the houses? In other words, what constitutes a, a household? Yeah. Thank you very much, Councillor McLean. Um, I don't know if that's the kind of information we would have. I think that would be in our HHPs, but I'll, uh, I'll pass it on to the director. Or possibly that, that's correct. That's correct, Jim. And allocations and lighting policy is the responsibility of Hebridean and Housing Partnership. We, we could engage with HHP and see what high level information they could uh, make available to us uh, in, in regard to you know the composition of households. But I would imagine that is information we would have to be very, very careful and keep at, uh, uh, at quite a high level to ensure there's no breaches of, of data security or the, the privacy of the householders. But we'll speak to HHP and see yeah. what is appropriate. Thanks. Uh, next up, Councillor John G. Mitchell. Sorry, can you hear me now, yeah? Yes, I can hear you now. Sorry, <laughs> this mute thing's a, a real issue, isn't it? Good morning, everybody. No, I was going to ask a similar question to Ray McKenzie answered, but I asked, and, and the answer from Roddy McKay is, is, is great news, and I would reiterate that as well, that uh, you know the fact that we are not only on target, but ahead of target has to be great news. That And also, uh, I think you hinted, Callum, and that there was some extension offered by the Scottish Government by, because of COVID. Do we have an idea? That's my first question. First, an idea of uh, what degree of extension they're considering. The second point is I'm also very pleased to mention on the back of uh, Councillor McMillan's uh, question about the Tarbert Police Station starting up again. Uh, it's been a, a catalogue of misadventures and, and almost farce about things. And, but I'm glad to see that that is, uh, that is starting again. And related to that, have the lessons been learned with regard to procurement and and you know, the, 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 uh, the whole process of uh, seeking out uh, contractors and so on, so that we don't have such a situation repeated again, whereby you know, the delays of it's not just weeks or months, it's, it's been years. Thanks for that. Thank you. Uh, we're in ongoing engagement with the, the Scottish Government in regard to you know the, the extent of the extension, if I can put it that way. Uh, you know, more homes division themselves are trying to figure out the totality of impact uh, across Scotland uh, and what their reaction to that is going to be. So it, it, it is slightly open-ended at, at the moment, uh, but no, more guidance will be coming from the government in, in due course. Uh, in regard to procurement, procurement is obviously uh, an issue for a HHP, but we do engage with them on, on these issues and on certain projects. Uh, I think there are lessons always to be learned when, when a project goes, goes uh, slightly off course, as it were. Uh, so, yeah, we, we work with HHP and we try to encourage, you know, different approaches to procurement uh, and hopefully there will be lessons learned out of the, the Talbert experience. Could I, could I just add to that, just, just to mention, could I pay tribute to Callum Ian, who's responded very positively to a letter I sent recently addressing the very severe accommodation situation in Harris. And I think there's a meeting of minds and a, certainly a high degree of consensus to to ensure that uh, certainly now or post-COVID anyway, that any, any any 
restraining of any further economic activity is not there because of accommodation problems. I do pay tribute to, to the economic recovery team, Calian and Joe McFree, for the support in this matter. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you. Um, next up, it's the conveners. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just in, uh, I should also declare an interest uh, in that I am a councillor nominated member on HHP, although although um, uh, that interest is is no different to any other councillor. Uh, who have been uh, on rep representing the council on bodies. Uh, I think uh, I, th I certainly think that um, uh, the point that councillor uh, Cal McMillan raised uh, that is still that is still Shush. the case for us as a council in terms of our policy. Um, I don't know who's I don't know who's uh, it's trying to. I don't know if it's a dog or is it somebody uh, somebody else trying to tell me to be quiet. But I'll I'll take the dog's word for it. Um, uh, but I, th I think it is important that as a policy matter for the COLA, it is still a 60-40 split. And the thing that worked against that was the way in which the Scottish government allocated funding towards the GOTIL development. And there is still, I hope, a commitment within the council that we will that we will rebalance that as a council as time goes on. And hopefully, it won't be it won't be uh, too long. The question that Cal McLean uh, asked there about about uh, allocations, HHP do it on the basis of the 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 size of the families in each in each housing area, and that's the only way they can do it. And it's and it's by no means an exact science. They may build a house for a four apartment house for a family, and they may have decided to move somewhere else. Uh, and so it's not an exact science, but it is it is something that uh, that HHP cannot afford to be building big houses when there is only going to be maybe uh, one person living in that house. Um, so they have to tailor it, you know, to suit the needs. But it's it's not an exact science, Colin. Thank you for that, convener. Um, I wonder if the minute will show Councillor yeah, Crichton asking the convener to be quiet. <laughs> Um, were well, you wanting to come in, Donald? I don't know if you were. Sorry, I was disciplining disciplining the dog, so uh, apologies <laughs> for that. I didn't realise okay. my mic was on. It's okay, that's no bother. Um, Ray McKenzie, your, your hands up. Are you want to come back in? Yeah, if, if I could, maybe on on another item, Chairman. Um, I did uh, uh, raise a point with the chief executive a couple of weeks ago. Maybe he could uh, expand on it or talk, and, uh, at least mention it to others, um, the answer he gave me to other members. Uh, and that was the question of, um, under the under the COVID um, uh, pan pandemic, apparently a lot of houses have been snapped up. And I don't know if that's, uh, you know, just... Uh, here in the third hand or whatever, um, but uh, maybe Councillor Mackay will have more information on that, but uh, uh, John Mackay. But uh, properties have been snapped up allegedly by people coming into the island um, and not necessarily moving to the island uh, full time even um, and contributing to the island, but as holiday homes. It's the old story. Um, now, uh, my question was, is there anything we can do? And I know somebody uh, pays 150000 or something that, you know, even quadrupling the council tax won't make much difference to somebody who's got money to spend. Um, but, uh, you know, it is a serious problem, as, as, as most of you know, that these villages um, are, are becoming... Not in dormitory towns, but but uh, holiday home towns, and, and more and more doors have been shut uh, on a on a on a, at least on a temporary basis. So um, it's just a point, and I wonder if anybody's well, if the chief executive can maybe expand on what he said to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray. Yeah, it's, it's becoming more prevalent this this issue. It seems to be in the headlines more and more often. Um, there must be some things we can do, and I think it's about time we, you know, we start looking into different ways of doing things. I wonder if the director has, or if, is Mr. Burr there? I'm not sure if he's in the room. Uh, yes, yes, he is. Yeah, thank but you, sir. Happy to let the director speak first on the issue, Chair. 
Okay, so, yeah, directors. Uh, thank you, Chair. We, we have run an exercise with local estate agents recently, just to try and get a, a feel of, of what is happening in the market, because there has been quite a lot of anecdotal uh, material being spoken about, you know, uh, along the lines of, such as Mr. McKenzie has outlined. We were getting quite a lot of inquiries at one stage uh, around businesses and individuals wanting to relocate to the Outer Hebrides in reaction to the pandemic. Uh, what we are not seeing, however, is a translation of, of, the, of inquiries into actual purchases. Uh, the, the feeling, the broad sentiment coming back from the state agents is that there hasn't been a COVID uptick, if you like, of uh, you know, new uh, purchases out with the Hebrides happening. There's the normal uh, churn of business inquiries and business and purchases from out with the island, but it hasn't grown uh, significantly as a result of COVID. But we are still aware that there are a lot of inquiries coming in, in in different ways around this. And it is an issue that we're exploring both to see from a business development uh, perspective in particular, are there ways in which we can get new businesses coming into, into the area. In regard to market intervention, uh, there are some new regulations coming out from the government in regard to lighting policy which we've uh, responded to uh, positively in the past. There's an ongoing consultation happening at the moment in regard to some technical aspects of that. So there may be some ways we can intervene on the, in the margins on that. But how we're able to intervene in the main housing market between willing sellers and willing buyers is a very difficult one uh, to react to in an open market society. So I hope that gives some uh, useful overview of the situation at present, Chairman. Thank you very much, Colleen. Martin, would you like to come in? Um, not much to add, Chair, just to say this is also a community a community planning issue and it's it's important to look at these things over time. I mean, one hears these, these stories, they may be different in different parts of the, the Western Isles, of course, and it's good to get a, a perspective from every from every area. It's not something, It's a, these are all commercial transactions, uh, as we know, at the end of the day, uh, but it's important that the public sector gives the necessary advice and leadership and sets expectations. So it's something we'll also raise at the Community Planning Executive Group uh, with the permission of the convener. So th thanks, Chair. Ray, were you to come back on that? Yeah, just, uh, you know, I appreciate we can't, uh, it's a willing buyer, willing seller and all the rest of it. Um, and I, I'm not suggesting, we want to increase the population um, of the islands uh, and anything that can be done to encourage businesses um, who are contributing to the community and uh, obviously um, young families, etc., coming, coming uh, or coming back indeed. Um, that, that's all, you know, all to the good. Um, it's just, you know, this business of um, people just buying up holiday homes and, you know, locals not able to 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 compete. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray. We'll have Char Councillor Charlie Nicholson next and then Councillor John Gina. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. I think this is an issue just now, and I'm glad to hear the director is taking it on board. But there's one issue that, as an authority, we really have to engage with the different partners, and that's the access to land for young people. Young people themselves have been on the news recently about the issue of accessing that. What are we doing in relation to that? Because we can work with the community states, we can work with the Crofters Commission when you see a bit of land down in Harris going for 200,000 plus on that. Uh, young people cannot uh, uh, look at that sort of aspect. And uh, as an authority, we should really be looking at uh, uh, the access of land for young people that live on the island to build, because that is becoming a serious problem. And I think Mr. McKenzie, Councillor McKenzie is right. Uh, I can only speak for uh, the kind of Stornoway area, but looking at the different estate agents, there's no doubt 
as you pass the windows and look at them on offer and sold and that, there has been an increase over the last number of months in these places anyway. Uh, months gone by, you didn't see the same uh, kind of buy or uh, offers as such in the window. So there has been an increase. But my point is about the land, accessing the land for young people to build and the crofting issue, because it's becoming a really challenging issue for young people in these islands, uh, Chair. So if the director could uh, answer that, what we're doing in relation to accessing land to help young people to build in these islands. Thanks for Nicholson. Uh, director? S supply of land remains one of our most significant challenges. You, you wouldn't think it would be such a great challenge when 75% of the population of the Western Isles lives on community-owned estates. Uh, but we are in engagement with the community-owned estates. We've written to all grazing committees throughout the Outer Hebrides uh, you're trying to see methodology for the, the release of land. We have a call for sites out almost on a permanent basis now, not just through the, the, the various local planning processes, but that is almost a, a permanent call for sites now. Uh, so, for example, in, in previous years, we would run feasibilities maybe three or four times a year. At present, we're running you know, feasibilities, you know, getting close to 20 times uh, a year on, on, on sites. So that there is that permanent call for sites, there is that engagement with the community landowners, and it may be worth their while writing to all the grazing committees uh, again, just to see if we can release more land. But you know, the, the supply of land is one of the key challenges to to uh, new new housing development, be it affordable housing or be it uh, in the private market. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, I, I can only but agree with what Charlie and Ray says. I mean, I'm sure everybody here has heard the anecdotal stories of a croft in Shilhubbers going for 200,000, the average plot in Luskintag going for 100,000. And the bottom line for that is the fact that young local people that stay here or local or people from Harris who would like to return here are totally priced out of the market. And as Callum Ian quite rightly uh, alludes to, it's quite anomalous when you think that we have North Harris Estate, the Trust, and the West Harris Trust, and perhaps soon to be the base of Harris Trust. And uh, I mean, they're between a rock and a hard place too. If you take the North Harris Trust, they've got buildings to, to, to maintain. They've got several staff to maintain. So they see that their, their asset is an equity to be, to, for money to be made on, but they're equally equally appreciative and I think that appreciation has been uh, well established by writing from councillors, from, from the Harris Forum, from the Corla, to say there has to be some sort of compromise situation here. You know, we do understand that they have to, to make ends meet financially and that involves perhaps realising some of their equity, but they also have a, a, a responsibility to the local young people in the community. And, you know, they are looking, I think they are looking and they're certainly being well advised to look at, you know, things like, uh, well, there's two things. First of all, there's the, you know, the special conditions clause, meaning that if you have stayed within Harris or you've got family within Harris or whatever, a variety of conditions, then you can access the land at a much cheaper rate than somebody from outside can access it. The second point I'd like to say too is in, in terms of the grazing committees. I'm the clerk of the, the Jury Fleet in Kinjibi, which is a fairly popular area, and we are trying to look wherever we can at releasing common grazing to young people at considerably more affordable prices. I mean, we obviously really get something back, but something that is well within the reach of the local young people. So there are things there are things going on, but you know. Staying still is certainly not an option because we have young people here that just are being frustrated week on month on month about the cost of housing. And Callum is right, the land is the critical issue. And on many occasions, they, they, the, 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 the trust hide behind almost the, the, the fact that the servicing isn't there, the water and electricity is going to be prohibitively expensive to install and so on. And that's often a bit of a blinding point of fact that they do have... have <coughs> some reasonable pockets of land 
but they are looking at a compromise. And I think that is inevitable. We'll never get a black and white scenario here. I think it's got to be it's feeding their own needs and also feeding the needs of the young people of Harris. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Crichton, followed by Councillor John Mackay, Callum McLean of that. So, Councillor John Crichton, please. You're on mute, Mr. Crichton. Thank you, thank you, Chair. I'm not a member of the public committee, but a lot of the things that have been mentioned before about access to land and, and the general housing strategy are things that we've talked about for a long time. But we now require really a view of, of, of housing right across the board in terms of how, how it's funded. For example, I know we've had a very good affordable housing programme that's been generously funded. But on the other hand, we've had a crofted housing scheme that has lagged behind in terms of funding. So I think we need a realignment in terms of how these schemes are funded and brought together and open up more access and for croft land to be better used from houses to be built and to take uh, people into our communities. I don't think there's a better scheme really uh, than the Croft Housing Scheme if it was aligned financially and through funding um, with, with, with the affordable housing programme. It would, be, it would be very successful, I think. But we've also had success in terms of the empty house housing uh, scheme where empty properties have been brought back into use. And that is something I think the community land uh, trusts uh, could be working with us on uh, to open up uh, housing in, in, these, in these villages too. And again, as has been said, uh, open up more common grazing uh, for, for building. Thank you. And apologies again uh, for um, disciplining the dogs. It's OK. It needs to be done. Thank you very much, Councillor Clayton. Councillor John Mackay? Yes, well, I, I can only speak for, for um, Ness on the west side here. Charlie House left for sale in Ness now. The last couple of months they've been just, just going every every day, really. And, uh, and it's, it's good to have people, if they weren't there, the place would be really empty. But we have to encourage our young folk to, to buy to, or, or to get, in, get into the market. But uh, as far as Ness is concerned, there's hardly a house left. <coughs> so I'm not surprised at that, I mind you. <laughs> location, Councillor Mackay. Uh, it's a Councillor Cal McLean. Yeah, yeah. First of all, about uh, the, the, the boom in, in the housing market. Well, you would expect that after a, a shutdown. And really, let's be quite honest in that. I, I, and I know of a number of houses around the Laxter area and the back area that have been sold and have been sold to local people. You know, so maybe we're, maybe we're, we're, we're jumping too much onto, onto the, 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 the other scenario. But, but access to land is another thing. I know, having been involved in, in a community landlord for the last nearly 20 years, I know that there is there is an appetite amongst community landlords to give land. That is absolutely, that's absolutely the first, the first thing. There is an appetite there. The second thing is, is that it really boils down to <coughs> grazing committees. And I was involved in grazing committees for nearly 20 years, up to, 20, up to 2015. And we give a fair amount of land up to a call and, and in tongue. Tongue was the same as, as our shares. We give a fair bit of land at a, at a very low price to locals. And, and there was a great uptake in it. But I tell you, this fact of the matter is it's crofting law. That's the problem. Because if you're a Grayson's clerk you, and to get involved in this, you will go through a terrible amount of legal stuff that you don't really, as an unpaid clerk or whatever, you actually don't want to look at. And then you've got the legalities hitting you from every side that you, because of, of the crafting law. Because if you, if you, for instance, give a wee bit of land away, you have then got to distribute that money that you get back <coughs> from that land to every single shareholder. And some of these shareholders are as far away as down in England and uh, absentee tenants. So really, again, it's to get involved in that is a minefield for any grazing clerk. And that is where the reticence is. It's the grazing clerks that aren't prepared to, to, to go through the minefield that's involved 
in actually getting rid of, 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 of or giving out land. And I think we should be looking at, at that in some way, actually getting the Gracings clerks and, get, and finding out how we can uh, access that land, because I'm sure there's plenty of Gracings clerks <coughs> that are quite willing to give land to locals, very willing. As, and there are, there's plenty of land available with us, but it's the way in which it, we, we, we have to access that land. And maybe that's an exercise that we should be looking at. Thank you very much, Councillor McLean. Can I just check, Councillor Mitchell, was your hand just still waving? I just want to take it down. Thank you very sorry, much. Sorry, uh, sorry. That's okay. Uh, convener, Councillor McDonald. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I think uh, this is almost uh, back to the future. Uh, there's, there's um, uh, housing is an absolutely critical issue. Uh, for people in our islands, particularly young people. And we've seen that, uh, as Councillor Nicholson said, uh, in the last few weeks, where a group of young people have have started to, uh, a campaign to try and uh, free up land, affordable housing to be built on that land. Now, if we go back uh, to the, the Shucksmith inquiry into crofting, and had that been given, the opportunity to to deliver on housing, which was a main major part of that inquiry, as well as other crofting regulations, relaxing them to make it easier for pe people, including uh, including village grazing committee clerks, to free up land for housing. And I do think, um, you know, I mentioned Mark Shucksmith there, uh, there. He actually he was actually on television uh, last night, I think it was, or the. Um, uh, talking about the very same issues. Nothing has changed a great deal. And if nothing changes, then why should we be surprised if we've still got the same problem uh, 10, 15 years later? Uh, so I think there is, I think it, there is, uh, it's time for us as a council to start looking again at some of these initiatives and then take that to government. Because at the end of the day, it's government that usually stymies uh, um, development in places where they're concerned that once they open that, uh, take the cork out of that bottle, then it's going to be mayhem. That is not the case within the crofting communities. It should be very easy to manage that. And I think we should, as a council, we should be looking to see what we can do with regard to that. Thank you very much, convener. Um, Prince Leader, Molly McKenna. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um, just, I just want to pick up on what uh, Carl McLean said, because um, uh, he certainly has plenty of experience, Carl, in terms of crofting, and some of it quite bruising, I know that. And uh, he's, he served uh, a long time in that particular role. And two things I wanted to say. One was, in a recent conversation with Joe McPhee, I asked Joe to bring to one of the committees the example of what actually did happen in Colin's area, because it's quite well known around here that uh, people locally in back, I think possibly in Tongue too, uh, were given the opportunity to purchase land at really reasonable cost. Land was set aside by the common crazy, and there are young families in there living on the island, going to our schools, shopping in their shops. So it can be done. Uh, so it's interesting to hear Colm saying about uh, the, the, the fact that maybe there is a willingness around other common grazings and further in, but it's just the sheer weight of work and technicality involved in it. So, so if that is the case, because I've always been mystified by the fact that you get community estates and you get common grazings, and we're not making any headway with them. Uh, they, they say they want young people to live in their areas, but when we put out a call for land, or as Paul Nian described earlier, we invite uh, people to come along and say, where can we start developing? It's not making any headway. So if one of the block blockages is what Colm is saying there around about the technicalities, and if there is a willingness for, for crofting and common grazing to give up land for people in that area, surely there must be a way in which we can navigate through that. We've got a willingness on one side, uh, we've got a demand on the other side, Let's see if there's a way we can break down the technicalities around that are facing our common grazing clerks. And should that be an action we take away from today, it might even mean us uh, getting all the common grazing clerks together to see if there is uh, an agreement a bit how we approach it, and also then take it to government, as, as uh, the convener has just said. So that's a very specific action which I think we should rest on. Otherwise, we will be, as Stokas has just said, 
in 10 years time talking about the same thing yeah. uh, were you waving there Keith yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah it's just that um my feeling is that this will look we'll be we'll be talking about this for some time to come about the the, the housing situation because at the end of the day once this pandemic is over there's going to be a lot of people and more so the younger people they're going to lose their jobs so we'll be talking about this for a long time to come that's my opinion thank you thank you councillor Dodson and councillor mckenzie is hand up again uh, yeah well thank you i'm i'm glad i raised this actually because it's been a very good uh, discussion uh, and it will be a better discussion if something comes of it. Um, I think a lot of good points have been raised today. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know where we take it from here, but, uh, you know, following on what Roddy Mackay says, um, I think we should really be pulling these things together and, you know, making, making you know, not... We don't want to be talking about it in 10 years and, and all the rest of it. We want something to happen in, in the immediate or very near future. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Uh, Mr. Bob? Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll look for the director's comments, but I think this is, this is something that the committee is minded to take that idea forward, as well as speaking to the grazing committees, which I think is a good idea. We should also speak to government and the Crofton Commission about how they can assist um, raising committees in this regard, because the, um, the point that was made about the process, I think it was Councillor McLean, uh, the, the process is indeed formidable, um, and we need, to, we need to ensure as far as we can, uh, and it's not all about our statutory powers, of course, it's also about the Commission's, uh, about how that can be made easier, if indeed it can be. So. Uh, I'll maybe ask the director to to uh, to see if there's any way we can take that forward in the immediate period. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, Chair. I mean, we are in discussion with with the Commission. We've got uh, open channels to all the community landowners. But uh, based on the discussion, we'll formulate a, a plan now to engage with uh, the grazing's uh, committees. Uh, it, it looks as if the idea of bringing the grazing's committees together to fully understand their issues and problems and see how we can uh, move out uh, of the, the difficult situation we're in uh, at the moment. Uh, I, th I think you know, when we're considering housing, I think there is quite a bit of land, uh, as you know, Mr. McLean has, has spoken about uh, the experience in Coll and back, that there, there is quite a lot of land being released uh, for private self-build housing. Uh, you just need to go down, you know, the Tongue Road and into back to to see that. And there are many communities throughout, you know, the Hebrides where you can see private uh, build being being happening. So we've got, got to differentiate between the private build sector and the affordable housing sector because there are different dynamics around both these sectors. So uh, th there are different challenges in both sectors and different ways we're going to have to think around both sectors. Uh, I think it is right what uh, Councillor Crichton was saying about uh, crofted housing. That is one of the most successful, efficient ways of building houses in, in the crofting counties. Uh, but that scheme has diminished some way. I know at the beginning of this housing process, we were talking to the government and trying to make a case to the government that all these various housing streams should be brought together into one cohesive, comprehensive programme. And I think there is still an argument to be had and a discussion to be had with government uh, around that. Uh, I'm convinced if some of the affordable housing monies were diverted into crofted housing, we could build housing quicker, cheaper, more efficiently in, in the Hebrides than through the, the affordable route. And these houses would be more uh, affordable to the tenants who, who would go into them. So there are a range of different elements to this discussion. Uh, we will seek to bring it together into some form of action plan and continue the discussion with uh, the Commission, the, the, the community landowners uh, and the grazing committees over the next period uh, and bring something back to the next meeting of, of the committee to try and coalesce that together into a set of, of uh, achievable actions. Thanks for that, Director. Councillor Clayton. Thank you, Chair. Just to add to, to all that Director has said there, has been brought before government and 
to the to the minister Kevin Stewart in in the, in the last while. So a dialogue has been opened. So we should continue that dialogue and push forward. Thank you. Indeed. Right, Councillor Fabian. Councillor Gordon Murray. Thanks, Chair. Um, good morning, Chair. Um, I was listening to that uh, uh, discussion with interest. It's a very good discussion. There's a lot of different points. Um, and as the director said, a lot of different elements. And maybe I, I was going to suggest, and I think a lot of it veered into sustainable development and communities and housing. So I was maybe going to suggest uh, that possibly a, a mug between sustainable and communities and inviting all interested parties along so that we can at least have some unified uh, steer uh, and discuss the way forward. Would that be a, possible, a local united front? Are you suggesting some form of super mug? <laughs> a super mug, yes. Director, would that be, would be an option? It, it, it is an option. You know, there is always always an optimum amount of people to have around the table to have a productive discussion. And when the number goes over a certain limit, particularly in the in, in working electronically on digital platforms, you know, you, you lose optimization. But you know, the idea of bringing this to to one or other of the mugs or a combination of mugs and bringing in you know some of the critical players in this, uh, I'm sure that can be uh, arranged over the next period. Um, yeah, thanks very much for that, uh, Director. Um, I, I, I agree that recommendation. Uh, I don't know if that can be added to the to the recommendations. Thanks. Just, just for, for noting, uh, Councillor Clayton and Councillor McKenzie, your hands are still up. Are you wanting to come back in? Apologies, I didn't mean to have my hand up. Just to say, a seminar would suffice, I think, for all members to contribute to this debate rather than amalgamating mouths. Yeah, I'd be in favour of that. Councillor Cal McLean. Yes, uh, thanks, Chair. I, I think that we, we do need to be proactive in this. And, uh, and knowing a lot and being an ex clerk uh, of the Graysons myself, I, I, I can't think of, we're not I can't think of the Graysons aren't interested in attending seminars. They're not interested in attending large meetings. I think the best way forward is is to use. I'm just suggesting this uh, uh, to Calamia. Is maybe is is if if, if members of his team actually meet with individual Graysons. Uh, clerks or committees uh, together. That is maybe a better way of doing it. That is the way that Grayson's committees operate better. They work better in their own environment uh, and, and, and somebody coming in. We've had that before. We've had people coming in from outside and speaking to us and speaking to them on a one-to-one -one basis and setting up something on, a, on almost an area basis. Three commit, Grayson's committees coming together and talking about the land in their area, whatever. Uh, it is the way forward uh, because there is a plenty of, of a land available. It's it's getting the land, and as Mr. Burr said, it is the problem is around the legalities of it. And I would hope that the current crafting commission is a lot more receptive than the last one. I have still got questions as to whether they are or not. And I'm just saying that actually I don't know if we've got a proactive. Crofting Commission. I would hope that we would have, but uh, I, I, I still have to see it. I'm sorry for being pessimistic in that respect, but uh, that's my that's my take on it. Thank you very much, Commissioner McLean. Um, I'm, I'm aware we're discussing performance management for quarter one, so we're kind of giving this quite a bit of airing. Uh, I'll take Councillor Manford next, then Councillor Murray and Mr. Bird. So, okay, so Councillor Manford. Thanks, Chair. A uh, very valuable discussion. I would suggest to you that one of the first things you take forward, whether it's a, a, whatever sort of forum, would be in the first instance, as just has been said there, uh, to talk to a, a clerks and chairs a, a necessarily, but just to give 
two individuals from particular areas rather than it be rather than the owners put entirely on clerks. What the first thing that we need to 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 do is to to learn to get understanding and to and to be in measure respectful to um, a clerks and chairs that in many, many circumstances over the years have been helpful, have done things. Um, but for one reason or another, they uh, they don't always work. There are difficulties. There have been there have been lots of successes. So we need to learn, learn from where it's gone right and where, learn from where it's become problematic because it does exist. I can speak from long experience um, of all, all aspects of this and also to, to learn how to take it forward after it takes place because there are times where it's worked and there are times where the land released has tripped up, shall we say, from a, a the simplest way is to give examples where where it's gone one way at sometimes a, 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 um, a very respectable cost with the crofters not having a, a looked for money from it, but the land having been sold on at a profit. A, at a at a significant profit in some in some ends. that's not widespread, but it has happened, and a, a, it leaves behind it very bad feeling. There also needs to be better communication, because I'm hearing just now at this meeting, where we want a crofters and a grazings to come and make land available. I could name you people that have already put forward a, 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 a land and have not been contacted, which makes that which which it leads to considerable anger when they see it advertised for more and they feel they've been ignored. So these are the sensitivities that need to be a, a working group, perhaps. But it needs to be some form of structure that will have insight and understanding of these problems and these difficulties. Just a way of making progress. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Manfred. Uh, Mr. Burr. Thank you, Chair. I was, I was just going to come in on the point of communication, just to pick up, up pick up a couple of the points that were made. I think the area approach may be the best, and that's how we're working, of course, in other consultative ways, and that, that uh, that's consistent with our community agenda. So I think uh, working on, but working with the clerks and indeed chairs on an area basis might be better in the first instance, and then a report is brought back. I tend to agree that a seminar is the best way to look at these policy issues, uh, rather than a member officer working group, even if that's expanded. But if we speak to the, if we speak to those involved, including the commission, including HHP, including government, uh, and bring back a report, I think perhaps that's the best way. But I'll be guided by the director uh, in that regard. Director, happy with that approach that's been outlined by the, the chief executive. Thank you. Thank you. That uh, Councillor Murray, last point. <clears throat> Um, I'm happy with that, uh, Chair. Um, I always find the seminars are a bit one-sided, so I'm sure there'll be plenty of discussion in that coming seminar. So as long as it's really able to discuss matters. Thanks. I agree with that. A lot of points have been made there today. There seems to be a willingness and nice to put the option. So yeah, that's be good to see something coming forward from that. Um, so insofar as this committee is concerned, uh, do members agree to note the report? Are your hands still up? Is that just waving or is it? Uh, 
assume from everyone else there's been no comments or members agreed to note the report. So next item is item four, and that is performance management 2019-20 quarter one for the Economic Development and Planning Department. The report is for noting details and overview of the Economic Development and Planning Business Plan and the late performance issues for quarter one. The Head of Economic Development and Planning will speak to the report and answer any questions. Director. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, in terms uh, in terms of this committee's interests, they are included at um, 5.1 uh, to 5.8 of your report, and they refer to library and information services. So that's all the, the, the scope of this committee's particular remit. We've outlined uh, some of the activities that we've been undertaking over lockdown, uh, setting up a specific section on the website, uh, your lockdown library, um, effectively offering a, an e-library um, uh, service um, and using social media channels, Facebook and uh, YouTube. Um, and as um, we've noted in the narrative, doing what we can to support people through this uh, last period. We've, um, as you as you know from, from recent uh, press uh, publicity, um, we've now started um, opening up the libraries in Stornoway, um, and uh, in Balavani with a click and connect service, working on um, an opening date for um, Tarbert uh, and, and the discussions regarding Castleby and uh, also uh, discussions in relation to resuming the mobile library service. So we are currently engaged in, as you can imagine, significant um, health and safety checks on all aspects of service delivery uh, and more information um, will will come out uh, in due course on on all the activities we're undertaking. So happy to take any questions, Chair, that any members may have. Are there any interest or concern to members agree to note the report? As agreement. Uh, item five. Uh, this report seeks approval of an annual assurance statement in respect of landlord services provided by the Cornelia for submission to the Scottish Housing Regulator. The annual assurance statement 2020 is provided as an appendix to the report. Angela Smith will speak to the report and answer any questions. Thank you, Chair. This is um, the annual report that we return to the Scottish Housing Regulator to confirm that we comply with all relevant regulatory requirements. I'm happy to confirm that there are no areas of non-compliance and we will be submitting the return once it has been signed after this meeting. Um, happy to take any questions on that. Thank you, Angela. Any questions, members? Yes. Uh, no hands up. So, do your members agree to the recommendation at 3.1? Yeah, I think that's agreement. No hands up. Thank you. I'm just wondering yeah. if we take item eight because uh, Chief Inspector uh, Graham is with us. Do that. There is an agreement. We'll take item eight next. Okay, so item eight. Uh, I'd like to welcome Chief Inspector Ian Graham to the meeting. This report provides an update on performance against the 2017 to 2020 Western Isles Local Policing Plan and the Western Isles Local Police Plan 2020 to 2023 is also provided at appendix two to the report for approval. Chief Inspector Graham will speak to the report. Uh, good morning, Chair. Good morning, Councillors and Chief Executive. Uh, thank you for the invitation to the committee. Before I introduce the two papers, I'd like to introduce Chief Superintendent Conrad Trickett, the new Divisional Commander. He is up in the islands for a number of days to travel through Lewis Harris, US, and this way he's speaking to staff, and he's done a couple of meetings today and on Thursday with a number of the Committee Chairs, Chief Exec, and the Leader and Commander of the Council. So I think he wants to give a few words in the first instance, if that's okay with yourself, Chair. Yes, that's fine. Go ahead. Welcome. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you, Councillors. Thank you for your time this morning. Um, really delighted to, to be here. Um, a shame that we can't be um, face to face and uh, understanding the, the need for social distancing and, and able to see some of, some of you on the screen now. Um, as uh, as Jim Inspector Graham just said, I'm I'm here for my first sort of formal visit um, to the island, um, some introductory meetings, um, so that I can meet some of uh, the elected members and the chief exec um, from a face-to-face -face point of view, um, and obviously meet with many of the officers. Uh, and, and that's very much um, the style of leadership that I'll be bringing to the division. Um, I, I'm open and personable, 
Um, I'm, I'm out there to listen to the views of our officers, um, of the community, and um, and your voices in representing the community. So we understand and um, the policing service that we um, deliver to you, and make sure that it is responsive to the community needs. Um, I do have some family links to the Western Isles. I'll, I'll declare that um, right away. So it's particularly particularly pleasing to be back here. I've spent um, many a week's holiday here with um, up in Back and Vatuska. I've still got relatives in that area and across in Golson. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted to be involved in the policing of an area that I know so much from um, from my upbringing. So so really pleased to particular to be involved in Western Isles and, and police in the Western Isles. Um, I, my role in this, and much of your role is, is obviously involved with the Chief Inspector and that is right and proper. Um, I'm very much in the background, um, obviously primarily based in Inverness, um, although I'll try and be visible here as much as possible. I'm here to support Ian to deliver that policing service to all of you. I'm very much here to try and link the best of local policing with the national support that we can provide when we need to. And um, so it's very much trying to get that balance right. Um, absolutely acknowledging the requirements for our community based policing approach on the island and an assurance to you that there's no big plans coming um, for any changes in that respect. So very much here to, to listen and learn um, and, uh, and understand the policing. Uh, look, looking forward to um, delivering the policing plan and um, listening to some of the performance and any feedback that you have for us. Um, so I'll not, I'll not uh, go on too much longer. Um, I'll hand over to Ian to talk through the papers and happy to come in and, and support any questions that we may have. So thank you for your time. Thank you for that. Uh, James, thank you, Chair and Councillors. I'll talk through the first report, which is the performance update, which covers the period 1st of April to 30th of June. Uh, we'll work through the report one section at a time. First one's road safety, road crime. Obviously, uh, fatalities wise, there was none recorded in that time. Drink drug drive offences obviously has dropped down, but obviously, you're aware just from the comments that that was during COVID lockdown, public roads were a lot quieter. Uh, speeding offences were actually at 24 speeding offences, so some proactive work and carried out there. And insurance wise, a bit of an issue, some of the feature in the islands, we had 27 insurance offences during that period of cars with no insurance. Quite a number of vehicles warn for antisocial behaviour and seized due to their driving standards and a number of other road traffic offences. Unfortunately, we never had road policing over just due to the lockdown. They were prioritising uh, periods elsewhere and obviously didn't make the festivals in July either. So uh, unless there's any points on the road safety road crime, I'd like to go on to the next section. No arms raised, so you can carry on, Chief Inspector. Okay, thank you. Serious organised crime. Obviously, it's reducing the harm caused by organised crime. You're all aware of uh, the drug issues within the islands. We did a lot of partnership work in relation to the NHS and local authority social work and um, through the courts in relation to enforcement. We had approaching 62, it's in one of the other pages, packages seized through the various post office and other courier services. So a lot of work through the Alcohol Drugs Partnership for funding for some of the work we're doing. So we're very grateful to them. And there's been staff employed recently in relation to working for going forward with that. All the links always come back to serious organised crime in relation to drugs. So we've done four misuse of drugs warrants over that uh, couple of months period and all positive returns, which means good work from intelligence wise and good support to the community for going forward for the drug side. I'm going to a twist of crime with no further. Uh, just uh, councillors, Mackenzie and Nixon, you have your hands up. Could the questions wait to the yeah, end of the report? Yeah, or are yeah. you relevant yeah, to the I was, I was trying, sorry. Sorry, Councillor McKenzie, were you trying to come in on something specific there? Yeah, well, actually, I was just a bit slow off the, the mark trying to get my uh, microphone on to the last one. Um, but the, the problem with speeding is still a major problem. Um, well, as far as I'm concerned, in Spanish, maybe in other areas. Um, but there's still uh, a number of small small, souped up, I don't know what you would call them, cars and motorbikes uh, doing, I would think, up to 60 miles an hour and 30 miles an hour areas and, uh, and places like Gotill Road and, and um, uh, Bayhead and so forth. Um, I see the numbers detected are up considerably and that's a good thing. Um, and will this drive, to excuse the expression, but 
with this um, uh, drive to um, uh, intercept people uh, continue? Is it done, you know, by the local force, or do you have road road people from the mainland coming in? Or uh, I think that was mentioned in the past, so I'm not quite sure, um, you know, what's going on day to day on the island. But there's definitely a problem here. Uh, with regards to speeding in the t in the town in particular, as far as I'm concerned. Also, Mackenzie. Okay, so next, were you want to run a similar point? Uh, th thank you, Chair. Uh, similar points to Mr. Mackenzie, and I won't uh, go over these. The one I will bring up uh, is the noise level of cars within the town, and to thank the the chief inspector for the work of the officers in relation to that. It's still an issue and we still are promoting report the roar, especially for the town centre. Uh, so thanks to the chief inspector and the staff for that and we'll carry on the different challenges we have in regards to that uh, in the future mm -hmm. months. Thank you, Chief. Excellent. Chief Inspector, do you have a response for Councillor McKenzie? Okay, thank you, Chair. Relation to the speeding, yeah, as you're aware, we have monthly operational meetings with the local authority, director of roads, sorry, uh, head of roads. We do as we prioritise the roads we're going to uh, tackle in relation to complaints. We also do site visits with the council in relation to any problematic areas. So we are looking at active travel strategies for within the town, to see the best way of promoting that, how the best way to deal with the noise complaints in relation to the vehicles. And uh, as Councillor Nicholson said, we have promoted our contact as the email system for people to raise their concerns with us through the email if they uh, don't want to phone direct or just to log it in a later time. In relation to speeding, yeah, we have it on our daily tasking. We are looking to see what else we can do in relation to the events. We are road policing are coming over usually three times a year. They will be over in November for getting ready for winter campaign, spending a day in Lewis and Harris and a day in the US in relation to speeding. So it's uh, every day we've got enforcement activity. We would like welcome any comments in any particular problematic areas. We do add that to our tasking sheet, which is why we've seen an increase in the speeding numbers. And we also work closely with the council for the speed centre placement, just to go back to the community and actually go through the speeds and the issues with them. But what we do ask is if you have one of your constituents complaining, try and specify the time uh, or the vehicles are coming through that are causing problems in your area, and it's much easier for us to deal with it that way. So I hope that answers your questions. Yeah, well, just if I can come back on that particular point, um, I wouldn't advertise too much that you're coming in November. But um, the other the other point about, uh, you know, in the past people have said, um, uh, you try and get a number plate or whatever, you know. Uh, but that's pretty well impossible because they're usually gone by the time you get a chance, you know. So that's a difficult a difficult way to do it and uh, without a speed gun or whatever um, it's pretty well impossible to, to um, it has been raised time and time again at community associations and community councils thank you thank you Chief okay. okay. Inspectors okay thank you Chair uh, before the Chief Superintendent would like to come in uh, it's one point Council McKenzie said it is quite true as soon as our road police and vehicles arrive in Alpo uh, people in the community in Stornway know they're heading over on the ferries. So it's uh, just an interesting thing we have to deal with. But the Chief Superintendent would like to come in on that point. Just, just to, to um, sort of support the points that Ian's already made. And, and you know, we recognise road safety as an absolute priority on the island. Um, you know, we'll continue to support with those road policing campaigns. And, you know, I'll, I meet now regularly with the inspector in charge of that team and you know, will take back from this meeting the concerns that have been raised and, and the level of support that we can provide or even increase and to the island. Having discussed with Ian the, the processes and the structures that are in place and um, with the council colleagues in Rhodes, you know, I'm really impressed with the, the process and the structure that's in place. So from your perspective and meeting with the community, you know, it will be an ongoing issue for us to tackle and you know we welcome those complaints because it informs the picture it allows us to target resources and it allows us to understand so i know it will seem very frustrating and um, for many of you in terms of some of those conversations but but please do keep feeding us the information and we will consider it in that partnership space and act on it and to the best of our ability and that was all i wanted to add thank you 
Chief Inspector. Uh, thank you, Councillor. I believe some other councillors had asked their hands up for questions. So I don't know if you want to go to them first. Councillor Kenzie, you've just left your hand up. So we can <coughs> Councillor Callum McLean. Yeah, yes, Chair, thanks. I just asked ask the Chief Inspector uh, a question here. It's re in relating to uh, accident black spots. Uh, I, I happen to live very, very close to one in which there are recurring accidents, possibly a couple of times every year. Uh, and and I, I have voiced my concerns as a councillor and as, as a resident uh, to the council about this stretch of road. Do you do you meet with with the, with your own officers? Were actually at the last accident two weeks ago. Uh, uh, do you actually suggest to the council department, the roads department, that there is such a thing as black spots, accident black spots, which need looked at? Because I do believe I've spoken to the council officers. It's not the first time I've done it. And I do believe that at this part of the, of the stretch of road, on the main road from Tosta to, to, uh, to Stornoway, that it's a fatality just waiting to happen. I really do. And, and, and I'm just asking you if, if you express your concerns to the Council Roads Department about such, an, such areas. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Councillor. Yes, part of the monthly meetings, we discuss every road traffic collision that's been in the islands. We look at the various factors involved in them, whether it's to do with the roads, the weather, driver behaviour. And yet we do, if, if we have an issue that we think there's either road, road signage required, reducing the speed limit, or any other street furniture to reduce the speed limit, we will raise that with the council. But every road traffic collision that we have is shared with the operational meeting with the councillors and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service to see if there's any factors we can get involved with. Into them in the future. Councillor Cal McMillan, and then we'll get back to the report. Cal, I know they won't. Amina wants to come in too. Cal McMillan first, please. Get on. Um. Thank you, Chairman. The uh, I was going to wait until the Chief Executive was expect, Chief Inspector was finished the report. So the usual bug there, but I would commiserate with Councillor McKenzie for living in the in the area of town it must be the neighbor it must be a neighbor problem that causes all of the speeding and uh, the uh, the ghettos of james street perhaps the the police could do a, a catch and release of the the young people are usually involved and release them used in barra because we could really do with that sort of problem our lack is the young people not the not the not the issues and fun that they cause of an evening but uh, Talking of catch and release, it might be part of the Chief Inspector's report. The issue of people being captured in Battersea and Ybarra and Uist and then taken to Stornoway. Alan, can I come back to that later on in the report? Okay, thank you. I'll do that. Thank you. And next convener. Uh, thanks, Chair. Just, just very briefly, uh, following on from the point that Councillor McLean made, Councillor Cull McLean, uh, in relation to accident black spots. There is a black spot not far out of Stornoway where the halfway house is between between uh, between the Arnish Road end and and uh, Loch's Garage. And uh, that's that's somewhere where I believe that uh, that maybe the council need to look at the alignment of that road, particularly at the bend. And it's usually uh, vehicles that are travelling out of Stornoway and when they come to the bend, they're they're going too fast, and they lose co uh, contact with the road simply because the road drops away. Um, and there's been numerous accidents uh, there in in the last in the last few years. I just I, I do think that uh, the the continuing dialogue with uh, uh, technical services and the roads people needs to needs to focus on where where there are multiple accidents. Um, uh, happening and and uh, hopefully uh, without any serious uh, injuries to anybody, but but there are places that we all know about, and it'd be really useful to to uh, to do some work on that. Thank you, convener. I think we're we're all aware in our own areas of various hot spots, and I think continued dialogue between the department and chief inspectors is probably the best way to do it. Um, so if we can move on, I think what we'll do is if the 
Chief Inspector can just complete this report and we'll have all the questions at the end, if that's okay. Okay, thank you, Chair. The next one is acquisitive crime. Obviously, uh, during COVID, we had less people on the door, less shops were open, so we've seen a reduction in shoplifting, also reduction uh, in the housebreaking. Motor vehicle crime we've usually found is people have been leaving their keys in the ignition. And as you're aware, there was one last week where the person was quickly and the vehicle recovered. So it's usually due to keys in ignition of people that they know, whether at a party or someone visiting the house or someone knows about it. So we have a good detection rate in terms of that and just trying some prevention advice. So I say there was less people on the door at that time, less shops open. So we believe that was one of the reductions. Antisocial behaviour, licensed premises checks, you can see a dra uh, dramatic reduction. That was due to a number of them being closed, just the main shops are open all through control. So now that the licensed premises, a number of them are reopened. We've started to put that back up again and there's no specific issues for them. The supply of drugs offences, we've been doing quite a push in relation to that. So it's just a small rise there, but there's a lot of work by my CID colleagues and colleagues on the mainland in relation to supporting productivity on the island, whether through the drugs dog or working with the EDP. The possession of drugs, I say 62 packages intercepted at the start of lockdown. So we're still working with the post office and curious in relation to the best way to deal with that. What we do nationally, we tie back to the divisions where they come from the postal stuff to try and put some work on the mainland to prevent the stuff coming to the island in the first place. The breach of the peace offences have gone up slightly. What we discovered was during lockdown, a number of COVID tickets were issued for people breaching lockdown. At the same time, they were committing other style offences, and it's a number of people who are known to us. Uh, common assaults have gone up again. You can see there's a significant rise in assaults on emergency workers. That was picked up by the chief superintendent when he arrived as well, just noticing the rise here in one other area in my division. What we found is some of the enforcement work we were carrying out to sort of put the conditions on COVID resulted in officers being assaulted. We had a significant number more custodies during that period than we would normally have. So a lot of work with the court and the criminal justice system, but that number has dropped down now and it's back to routine levels. So we think that was just due to the pressures of living under COVID and the enforcement activity we were carrying out. There was no significant injuries to officers and uh, all the officers were able to continue duty on each occasion. The Operation Notebook, that's to do with antisocial behaviour by neighbours in relation to loud music, etc. calls. We have really good relationships with HHP and the local authority in relation to how we deal with these matters. As such, we have no one on our particular list on the warning system that we have, and uh, that's not really reflected elsewhere in the division, so that's a really good result for us. Vandalism is a significant issue within the islands. We've had a really big spike over that period and the period up till now. It's spread all over the island, whether from Barra, villages in Uist, all the way up through Lewis and Harris. So a number are some local youths we've got concerns for, but also it's just in relation to other matters. So that's something we are looking at quite closely in terms of how we can prevent that and uh, how we can stop it in the future. <coughs> Antisocial behaviour warning for vehicles. Uh, there's not many on there for the one, but we've issued 13 in the last six weeks in the town centre in relation to the misuse of the vehicles with their driving standards. So that'll come up in the next report. And we've had a couple more seizures in the last while. Prevention activity, we have the monthly meeting with the operational partners of the Council and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. And we also have national meetings in terms of road safety strategy with the local authority and the Fire and Rescue and Ambulance Service also take part in. The stop search has also dropped down. A lot of uh, process was on COVID. So you can see that we've got a number of stop searches, was only seven. Uh, sorry, the period last year and four now with positive. So that's really good in terms of the positive returns. And vulnerable people, this, as you know, is one of our biggest areas, which is why we've got the contact assessment model coming in to identify the right way to deal with people. The number of sexual uh, crimes incidents uh, stays the same, but we have a significant rise since then in terms of online offences, which we're dealing with through our public protection. Domestic abuse, it's gone down by one. There was a dramatic drop at the start of COVID and it's come back to normal levels. The inspector here chairs the Violence Against Women and Children Working Group, so we work closely with partners in relationship how we deal with that, and that's good going forward. And hate crime, you can see very low numbers within the islands. Overall, up till now, we've only been three hate crimes reported since the 1st of uh, April, so really good community work within the islands in terms of the number of people that are travelling through, and uh, quite pleased to see the low number that we have here. We had a review carried out to do with hate crime. We met with some inspectors from Majesty Inspectorate, and that went really well. They placed the partnership work within the islands uh, when we met with them face to face, and they shared a report due to commit, which will be shared with all elected members. So, really good work in relation to how we deal with these matters. Missing persons, that dropped down during COVID as well, so the number can't really be reflected on for the previous years. And at the moment, one of the issues we have is 
people who are in care looked after their accommodation going missing, but really good working with a partnership, social work and education about the best way to take that forward. And the final point is terrorism and public order. We have a local officer involved in that. They come along, they speak to the local authority links. We tie in with stools, with local community groups and the best way to identify any concerns people have for going forward in relation to social media work or any concerns that they may have. So it's a really good relationship in the islands. We had a contest meeting last year for a uh, practice exercise for Prevent Nominal, and that was taken, led by a member of the council, and it was really well thought done by the uh, members from the Scottish government that attended to the meeting. So really good relationships in the islands in terms of how we're going forward with that. I think that's all the points for the period during lock initial lockdown. Inspector, uh, Councillor Dodson, I see you waving. Uh, yes, <coughs> yeah, I'd like to thank the uh, Chief Inspector for that report. Very concise and very encouraging. Um, what the only question I would like to ask is: Has the Chief Inspector got any update from the social from the Scottish Government relating to parking of vehicles on pavements, etc.? Okay, thank you, Councillor. Uh, the parking on vehicles and payments comes under the local authority legislation, so that's still working its way through, so it'll be over to them in terms of the enforcement. But we will work with the traffic warden and the Western Isles, is obviously funded by the local authority, that's how we can assist in enforcing that. But it's still, I believe, a consultation with through COSLA and the other local authorities about how best to implement that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor John Mitchell. Thank you, Chair. Uh, hi, John Mitchell, Councillor Harris and South Fox. Hi, Ian. Thanks again for your uh, very comprehensive report. Uh, got a couple of questions. First of all, uh, how does COVID-19 affect the presence of police personnel in the Stornoway office? And I ask that in the context of the police presence in Tarbert. Uh, and equally, the, the second part of the question is really about the frequency of the presence and I'm thinking in particular recently as I'm sure we I, I, I did make contact with you and you responded about the dangerous parking of camper vans particularly along Northdown which is a fairly narrow road anyway in many cases simply a sim single track road and it actually caused the bus driver to drop people off at the road end it's a mile long uh, horizontal rain like we're looking out the window today and older people carrying messages is almost mission impossible if the bus driver refuses to go along the road and we have to understand it. You know, it, it, it can't it can't be expected to go along the road where there's a camper van illegally parked. So basically there's a generic question about uh, the, the presence of police in, in the Harris area and the specific question as in, in terms of... Okay, and the specific question of responding to the, the, the Northern issue. Thanks for that. Okay, thanks, Tyne. So in the first instance, no, the, the police were very quick to respond when COVID started. We had our staff trained in PPE equipment and deployed just a bit straight away. The only thing that changed in the station was the closure of the front office for a couple of months. That's reopened. We have a number of staff working out of the Tarbert office who live down in that way to try and keep the spread. So we did links. The officer for Harris. He obviously, uh, his main base is travelling down to Tarbert, etc., and going around the Haddis area. But obviously, he has calls coming elsewhere and he has to support other officers. But he is aware of your concerns yeah. in relation to the dangerous parking at Northam. What I would say is request people phone in at the time when the, you know, the bus driver, if he'd make contact with us at the time, we'd have to provide a unit to try and assist. But we are aware, as you, in the email you pointed out, a number of concerns. We've had that throughout the islands, especially in uh, Haddis, it seems to have been affected more than most areas. Mm -hmm. This is dangerous parking, uh, illegal parking, in relation to parking and laybys, etc. So I think my email I suggested potentially going through with a working group of some sort to see how we can deal with this matter for the future. But I would encourage people to report at the time. But uh, in the Stormway office, no, we still have full deployment. We've been we were very quick. We didn't really change our deployment model in terms of what we attend to. But uh, I raised the issue of North and the Harris officers down with yourselves today. And uh, I'll speak to him again just in terms of the visibility side. But it's a case of if someone does have a concern, please phone in at the time. And we can then send a unit to try and deal with it there and then rather than trying to play catch up. So but there's any further concerns, but we would like to take forward something for next year in relation to the camper vans, whether we just speak to them or they come off the ferry with a traffic warden or do something with the tutors board just to try and encourage uh, better parking for the future. 
Thanks for that, Ian. I mean, obviously, the concerns within the Harris community seem to be exacerbated. You talk about a number of officers in, in the Harris area. Is it, is it not the case that the, the actual uh, police staff that live in Harris are retired and that the actual one serving officer that works in Harris is travelling from Stornoway? And that obviously gives rise to just some degree of concern about availability and presence within the Tarbrus. I'm sure you understand that. Yeah, thanks, Tencer, of course. Uh, as you know, the police station Tarbert is occupied by one of our sergeants. So we have a sergeant living in the community and he obviously works in Stormway, but feeds back what's happening there. The Harris office at the moment has been used by two of our CID colleagues in terms mm -hmm. of health and social. One lives in Stalpe, one lives just outside Tarbert. So, but David Fraser, yep, he bases himself here. The purpose of that is to make better use of the vehicle as well. So when he's off duty for a number of days, we can use of his patrol car. But no, we will encourage more use for going down there. We did prioritise some of the areas we were patrolling. And then eventually uh, David, as you know, was put down to Harris more often. But we will try and get him down more often in the future. But the more concerns we have raised to us, then it's easier for me to prioritise where I put the resources to. Yeah, I mean, the final point is, I don't want to go on to the length of this one, but I appreciate that you know internal transfer makes a definitive response as to where they are and at what time and so on. <clears throat> but I'm just, and I, I think I brought this point up to you before, Ian, and that is the if there was even some sort of, of uh, not definitive, but perhaps a, a broad brush description of availability of the, the, the member of staff that is travelling over from Stornoway. You know, there is a feeling, whether it's right or not, is that you know, just what you said in terms of uh, vehicular convenience, that it's a lot easier for the one serving. I know that there's a sergeant that stays in the police house is, is working out at the Stornoway office per se, but there is a, a, a perception on occasions that the person, the single officer that's working and, and, and working in, in Harris uh, tends to be in Stornoway perhaps more often than a lot of people would like. I'm just sharing that with you. Okay. No, that's fine. Thanks, Councillor. We when you start shift, we have to prioritise where their resources are put to in terms of the calls. But uh, I will share your concerns about you spending more time in Stornoway and see if we can get them down in your own area much more. Uh, Councillor Gordon Murray. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, welcome, Chief Inspector Graham and Chief Superintendent uh, Thicket. Um, I was just going to say to the Superintendent, uh, you made a couple of winning points there by mentioning your relations in Bach and Baska <laughs> and Gulson. Well done for that. Um, but I was just going to mention the, the actual spike in vandalism. Uh, it's been probably the, the subject of a lot of discussions in uh, uh, committees and community association meetings uh, in Stornoway. And I know that um, uh, Chief Inspector Graham has been very supportive of partnership working and He's been very successful uh, in partnership working as well, and he, he should be commended for that, especially with his work with HHP. But I'm wondering whether um, he would be supportive of uh, a, a kind of multi-agency approach uh, to maybe support or help address some of the underlying issues that's causing the vandalism, such as the previous uh, Outer Hebrides Community Safety Partnership um, whether that should be um, revived and that would maybe help. I know that I've spoken to a couple of officers about this and they, they were saying that the OHCSP was um, a, a great initiative that really helped a lot. Um, so I wondered what uh, Chief Inspector Graham's thoughts on that were. Okay, hey, thanks, Councillor. One of the issues we have at the moment is a particular group of youths, as I'm sure all councillors in the town are aware of. So we had the two meetings before COVID started in relation to some work with Action for Children, the Bridge Centre, the Castle Grounds, you know, owners, responsible keepers. We've now got weekly meetings with the local authority social work and education in relation to a number of the youths, just to see best way to tackle them. So that's not something that's really affecting other areas within the island. It's an issue appears to be specific to Stornoway. In relation to the community safety, we have a number of other working groups where we tie in with either councillors or with the local communities. So, but we're always keen to look back and see what worked before. So I'd be happy to speak off table either to yourself or anyone else that wants to be interested. 
We obviously had the bi-monthly community safety forum with yourselves coming to the station. We just put a halt on that due to COVID. We were trying to restrict the number of visitors to the building, but we're happy to start that up again as well. Um, that would be great. I, I think it it was in the OHCPP, so I don't know if I could ask the <clears throat> convener if he could maybe request that the OH, OHCSP is revived or brought back uh, or whether we requested. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm looking for some advice on how to actually um, revive this uh, multi-agency approach. Uh, uh, th thanks for uh, thanks for that, uh, Councillor Murray. I, I think that's a matter for the agencies uh, to get together and, and see uh, whether uh, there is significant benefit to to doing that. But uh, uh, you know, as far as the community planning partnership is concerned, a lot of these issues are dealt with through the through that uh, forum in, in any case. But uh, certainly, we've got no issue with uh, with having another look at that and seeing whether whether we can uh, improve things on on uh, what they are currently. Thank you, Camina. Thank you, Chair. And thank Hi. you, Chief Inspector. Thank you very much, Mr. Councillor Murray. Uh, Councillor Ray McKenzie. Uh, you can hear me okay, can you? Yes, yes. thanks, Chairman. Um, yeah, I, I think what these figures uh, show is that, that generally um, the West Niles is a safe place to be and um, to, to live. Um, uh, and the figures, you know, if I'm sure. Places, other places, wherever they are, would would die for. Well, maybe not. That's not the right expression, but would be very pleased to have these figures. Um, I, there's one or two things which um, obviously keep coming up, and that's the car offences, the drugs, and vandalism, which has just been covered. Um, I, I, there's on the figures there. There's um, sexual and domestic abuse including non-recent uh, figures. Um, what proportion, of, I mean, I know they're, they're low figures anyway, um, but what proportion of these figures are actually, uh, you know, historical, if you might, you might call it? Uh, thanks, Tensler. We normally have about 30% are non-recent. They usually come about because we have a report of domestic incident. We'll attend and whilst we're taking statements of the victims, they will come up with events that happened the previous year or a couple of years before. So it's usually about 30 percent are non-recent. Thank you for that. Thanks. Councillor Carl McMillan. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I've got two questions, really. One is a, uh, an observation on trends. And the other is the, the usual bugbear, but I'll go to the trends first. Um, uh, as somebody whose use of drugs is, is probably confined to caffeine and the occasional glass of beer when I'm allowed, uh, the the 28 figure in the year to date in possession is that due to the increase in usage, or is it? that the police has more time available to look at these sorts of things. And when I noticed that the 62 parcel is, it's parcels uh, intercepted, is, is that a, an increase or is that a normal sort of level, a base level that is worked on? It was just the, the curious, when 20, that, that's a, a significant increase in a variation on a, a base of 28. So, sorry, a base of eight. So that's a uh, hundred and something percent for those who can do numbers. But the it was just like curious: is there an increase due to COVID and people in lockdown, down, or is that just the normal usage, which can be uh, given more time and resources at the moment? Thanks, Ken. So, uh, what we've noticed at the start of lockdown. There was significantly less numbers on the ferry, and they had a good reason to travel on the plane. And so we noticed a lot more parkages coming through the postal and courier service, which I might previously come across with persons on the other ways of transport. So the work by the dog handler working with ADP, tied in with the post office and couriers, and just started noticing a spike then. But uh, after a lot of enforcement activity at that time, the spike went back down and the ferry opened up again. So we've come back to trying to proactive work on the ferry. So 
we noticed the spike was around the same time as the lockdown really kicked in and people were reverting to posting it rather trying to get it across with individuals across onto the island. So the work is continuing with them. So it doesn't take long within the islands. If we've worked at doing in the post or tears, people will look at alternative methods to get drugs onto the island, unfortunately. So as well as being a good success for us, we now have to work out the other methods we're using to take it onto the island. Right. So, so, so it's more of a, it, it, it's what you would call normal usage, but the abnormal here <coughs> is that it was more no, noticeable uh, in in the way that you managed to intercept or collect. Is that, yeah. is that your is that your impression that more than it, it's not just it's not the figures it's just your impression that it was. Thinking yeah, it's the impression was we reported back to the COVID group that was dealing with stuff in the island just that we had seen an increase when the lockdown started because people weren't able to go back and forth to the mainland as much. So they were coming through the postal and Kudia. But as I say, with success, they just start using alternative methods, which you then have to work with the partners to see how to target them. All right. so, so that's more of a baseline rather than a, a spike in usage. Yeah. And the other thing that I was uh, going to, to look at is when people are taken from, due to police policy and the way we are, is, is there a, a change in policy to just take these people back to their own islands or a safe place uh, due to COVID restrictions and movement? Or is the, the police policy still the same as it was before? What we've done with Castries and what you're referring to is if we have someone arrested in Barra and they have to appear in court, obviously depending on the rest of the day before the court or a Friday for a court appearance on a Monday, we have to look to see where the court's going to sit. During COVID, we've managed to make use of video conferencing so we can get someone to appear via video conferencing from a particular station. So that's something that we're looking at. Obviously, there's been huge issues in the press about criminal justice, the way that they deal with matters. And so we're still making use of criminal of the VC for anyone appearing from remand so they can get with quite quickly. But if someone requires to come up here as a court sitting or because of the 24-7 staffing availability up here, we would look to put them. But what we have learned, if you highlighted it yourself, is if we're arresting them, taking them up to the island for a few days, we have to have something in place to return them. And that's something we're trying to make sure the officers have and consider before we start transporting them throughout the islands. Thank, thank for that, Chief Inspector. I'm glad that there is a, the mindset is it's not just taking them one way, that they have to be returned. That uh, even when birds migrate, they, do, they go both ways, so that it's getting these people back home to a safe place that that was my concern rather than being left somewhere, whether it be Dingwall or Glasgow or Stornoway, you're still various journeys and ferries from home. So, but that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor uh, Nicholson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just to pick up uh, a couple of points. First of all, on the community safety, out ahead of this community safety partnership. That was ongoing uh, in the last council with 27 partners. And it's been something, along with other members, that we've been trying to encourage and uh, spoken to the uh, chief executive and the director uh, in regards to this to take it forward. Because we haven't had this in this period of the council. And I believe that uh, it is the head of the fire operation in the Western Isles that's meant to be taking it on. And there is a need for that group to come together to look at uh, working on the community safety. But uh, moving on, uh, the chief superintendent, welcome he him here and uh, thank you for coming in. A couple of questions for you, if that's uh, possible, sir. Uh, one of them is uh, the, the 101 number. We were meant to meet with a consultative group from Glasgow uh, on a few occasions about police matters. This is one that is challenging uh, with residents in my area and I know in other areas. And it would be much better if we went back to the original of contacting the local stations because uh, uh, the 101 number is very challenging in many ways, especially for senior citizens and the amount of questions that have been asked, etc., and not been put through to where you want to go through. So that's the first one. The second one is 
uh, in regards to resources. And we're hearing just now from other members and from uh, our own Chief Inspector Patrol Carfo Harris and uh, the aspect of uh, uh, manpower within the islands and that. Well, the point I want to ask you, Chief Superintendent, is uh, could more outreach be given to our local Chief Inspector uh, to allow uh, uh, the police uh, members to be attending community meetings? Because after the last number of years and that, because of the pressure uh, that the Chief Inspector is under in regards to uh, uh, manning the Western Isles and resources within the Western Isles. It's been uh, uh, quite uh, difficult to get uh, members to local community meetings, and that has changed dramatically since uh, the government has moved to uh, Police Scotland. Uh, years gone by, there was more kind of engagement in that area, and it's one area we want to carry on. But in saying that, partnership working is very strong by the Chief Inspector and by officers as such, but we need, we need the aspect of uh, getting some more extra hours so that officers can get involved in local groups. So uh, two points there. So um, if we tackle the, the 101 issue first, um, it, it isn't just the Western Isles that have raised 101 as an issue. It is, um, it's a matter of concern to other communities as well. So it's one that I'm um, alive to and one that I need to to kind of understand, it's one of these things about I'm listening and I'm 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 picking up on some of these issues, uh, and 101 is one of them. Um, I, I am conscious that during COVID, in particular, um, the the call centre um, has been very challenged. Um, so our calls in relation to COVID um, and indeed normal demand, whilst normal demand dropped off um, initially, it, it's increased back to normal, if not um, more than before sort of levels. So so the demand on our service um, policing wise is, is is as high, if not higher than it's ever been. And in that, in that same context, because of social distancing and because of the additional measures that have to be put in place in the call centers, they are running at about 85% um, staffing capacity. Um, and so they're actually dealing with a higher level of demand with a lower level of, of resource. So I suppose from that sort of strategic place, um, they're actually doing very well to, to manage the calls that they are doing within the times that they are. Um, nevertheless, I recognise the frustrations that, that the being on the, the calls does, um, does have with, um, with members of the public. There's not an easy answer here because the solution that you propose in terms of returning um, to the um, to the way that it used to be managed, and, and that's a way that again is is a is a is a process that was in place in in many places, and um, that that is too resource intensive for Police Scotland as an organisation to return to. So to have 24/7 cover across every police office to receive calls from members of the public is not an efficient and effective way of dealing with the, the volume of calls that we have, which is between three and four million calls a year. Um, so it's a significant volume of calls. And, and the reality is, as a, as a national organization, we have to deal with that in the most effective and efficient manner. And that is using call center technology um, and the application of a resource that can deal with that. And tied into that, and, and, uh, and Ian touched on it very briefly, um, the way that we're trying to assess the calls now is very much based on threat and risk. So there's two aspects to that. The first thing is, um, if someone is in an emergency situation, then they should be phoning 999. So there should be nobody who feels in a dangerous situation that is waiting on the end of a 101 call. And, and the national performance around treble nine has not really been affected um, by the impact of COVID. And because we have managed to maintain, that's, that's the priority for us to answer treble nine. There is a knock on impact on 101, but nobody who's in any sense of danger should be listening to 101. They should be dialing 999. So that's the first sort of layer of protection for the communities. Um, if they are um, wanting to report something where they're not, um, or they don't perceive themselves to be in danger, 
then the operators are going through a series of questions to try and identify the vulnerabilities and the, the threats and the risks associated with that call. And this is very much because of the changing demand that we face um, as a policing organization. So, so this in, you know, we're not experiencing the same number of calls about crime and about antisocial behavior uh, that we used to see as a policing organization. 80% of the calls are around vulnerabilities, concern for people, um, the, those style of calls. So it's a very different type of call that we're, that we're receiving and hence why we've got to have people trained to do that um, threat risk and harm assessment. Um, so I appreciate I've given a, a fairly broad answer to, to quite a specific point around 101, but I'm, I am absolutely acknowledging um, how that feels to, to some people. There is better communications we can do in respect of that. There are some there are some simple techniques that callers need to employ, which is actually to stay on the phone um, rather than our experience is that if you if you dial 101 and you maybe wait for a minute or two and you hang up and then you call back in an hour hoping to get through, you'll probably never get through. You do need to stay on the call, put the phone on loudspeaker and it will be answered. You, it's a queuing system that operates so we can be better at trying to communicate that out to people. Um, and um, and I think, I mean, you, you said that there was supposed to be some consultation and it wasn't clear to me if that had happened or not. Um, but if it hasn't, I'm seeing you shake. If it hasn't, then that's something I can take back and actually get the people who understand um, the mechanisms and the product to come back and try and provide some reassurance. And um, But I suppose strategically it is a change of approach and that not only we've taken, but many, many public sector organisations, if not all of them and private sector, have, have gone down that approach. Um, in terms of the sort of resources piece, um, and, and I recognise the comments made by the council in terms of the, the Harris um, footprint, um, uh, you know, we were constantly evolving our policing model. Um, many of the Many of the items that have been discussed on the um, on the performance report and that will come on to in the policing plan, and many of these issues um, are not necessarily dealt with directly by officers that are based in the Western Isles. Um, so online fraud, cybercrime, terrorism, and um, all of these um, issues are dealt with by national police and resources. So I suppose it's for me to try and reassure you that it's not just about the officers that you see in the community. There is a far bigger team um, that it's incumbent on Ian and myself to, to direct and support um, all the risks that face the community of the Western Isles. And some of them will be better dealt with um, by specialists that, that sit away from the island. But, but notwithstanding that, um, my, my background is community policing, albeit in different pieces of Scotland. Um, and, I, and I know Ian, uh, you know, shares that background, and and so having that community focus and being available to the community, being known to them, being accessible to them, and listening and understanding their concerns, I absolutely recognise is a key feature of community policing. And um, the we need to we need to keep evolving how we do that because we don't have we don't have extra officers that we can. Um, that I can hand over to Ian because there's area commanders in the, the rest of the division are, are asking for, and they challenge me, they do challenge and ask for resource. And I, I hope that continues um, and we'll support absolutely where we can, um, but I don't have a magic pot either. So I, I, the resources I have, we need to deploy in the most efficient way, recognizing that actually many of the national resources are supporting local policing here. But for me, it is that accessibility. And I mean, community meetings is a really interesting one because, uh, again, I recognize that historically uh, a local community officer would, would always be sitting at these uh, meetings. Um, you know, there are other ways that we engage as well now. Um, you know, the use of social media online. Um, Ian just referenced a, a, an online application for complaints into ourselves. So, so we do need to sort of keep moving forward in terms of how we engage with everyone and not just the people that choose to turn up at a community meeting, but, but equally, 
I recognise that that is part of that engagement strategy. Um, Ian might want to come in about some of the detail around that because I obviously don't have that level of understanding at this point. But I think the point around the visibility in Harris, the point you raise around the engagement that some of these more formal community structures, that's something we can take away and I can discuss with Ian um, and we can just get to the right approach uh, based on our resources now, um, using that as one engagement tool, but recognising that isn't the panacea. There are many other ways that the public communicate with us these days, and that's just one one way. Um, so hopefully I've, I've, I've helped answer some of your queries, Council, but thank you for, for both of those points. Th thank you, uh, Chief Superintendent. And in regards to the 101, uh, we're not talking about during the COVID area because it's been uh, very professionally handled, etc., and the different pressures. We're talking about prior to that and uh, the aspect of engagement in regards to that. And our own chief inspector locally here has appointed uh, uh, officers to different community groups throughout the islands. The issue is that they've got so uh, much pressure on other, uh, if you like to put it, uh, uh, objectives and that a lot of the time we're not managing to see the local officer that's appointed to the community council or residents or community associations and that's why I'm saying if uh, more resource could be given to the chief inspector and outreach and that uh, that would be helpful to get uh, more engagement in that level but our engagement is excellent with the force here and uh, we thank uh, you and uh, the Chief Inspector for everything that, that you're doing for our community. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, so make sure your hand's still up. I don't know if that's just from the last point you made. Or you want to come in. Sorry, my mistake again. <laughs> no bother, John. Uh, Chief Inspectors, were you going to discuss the the police plan for 2020 to 23? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, as you're aware, I seem to date another month ago for consultation. Thank you for the feedback I had in relation to support for it. Obviously, it's about the long-term policing strategy. It's what Police Scotland sets out and how it works to the area commands. It's an uh, emphasis of partnership working, working within the island communities and how to take that forward. Priorities are as to be expected, road safety, road crime, serious and organised crime, acquisitive crime, anti-social behaviour violence disorder, protecting vulnerable people and terrorism and public order. These are the priorities have been identified through the Year View Count survey and through various other measures in terms of the Scottish Police Authority, Scottish Government, and obviously uh, Police Scotland, how the prioritise for going forward. A lot of work will be reported through the Community Planning Partnership, obviously the chair here at this meeting, tying into the local outcome improvement plan. We have membership on the locality plans as well, and also the reporting systems we have for supporting our people, reporting to the committee yourselves, reporting to our councillors, and reporting to performance speed, which I have weekly with the divisional command and the other members of the command team. And it's just about uh, support measures for accountability and scrutiny within the policing plan. So it's just seeking uh, opinion and seeking approval from yourselves in relation to it. And um, myself and the Chief Super quite happy to answer any questions you may have on it. Thank you very much. Any questions, members? No, no questions. Okay, thank you very much, Chief Inspector. So, um, can I just ask, do members agree to note the performance update and recommend approval of the Western Isles Local Police Plan 2020-2023 as detailed in Appendix 2? Noted. 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 Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Chief Inspector and Chief Superintendent, for attending. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. If you want, but you don't have to. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> uh, now we'll go back to Item 6. And that is homelessness. And apologies to Lorraine, we had you quite early in the agenda, but you're further on again. Um, so this report concerns a consultation on a ministerial statement for modifying local connection referrals in Scotland and seeks delegated authority to the local community to respond on behalf of the Columbia prior to the deadline of 23rd October 2020. Lorraine Graham will speak to the report and answer any questions. Lorraine. Thanks, Chair. Um, so members may recall last year we had a similar consultation on the suspension of local connection. Uh, following on from that, um, the Scottish Government um, um, enacted an order in November last year where they were going to carry out a further period of consultation and then publish a statement 
by November this year, but that has now been extended for a further six months as a result of um, coronavirus. So local connection, um, you will be aware uh, at the moment, if a household does not have local connection, we can refer them back to the area uh, or an area with which they do have a local connection and we have no statutory duty to accommodate them permanently. But this proposal will mean that we will have a duty to accommodate anybody who is unintentionally homeless from any area um, within our area they present here. And numbers have historically been quite low of those presenting um, with no local connection. So on the face of it, it might appear that it wouldn't have much of an issue for us locally. But it's a reality, um, not just for us, but for other rural areas, and in particular for the islands, that we've historically had one or two households who can present each year with significant multiple and complex needs. And we just do, very often do not have the specialist services required locally um, to meet their needs. And just one or two households can have a significant impact for services and resources locally. So it's proposed that we, we put a, a similar view across to the Scottish Government as we fed back last year, um, where we believe it is going to have an impact for us locally. They also ask for our views on how we will, um, on, on how we think they should rather um, monitor the impact for each local authority and what criteria should be in place for considering the capacity for a local authority to, to deal with um, those households with no local connection. So the, this report just um, seeks approval for the, the Director for Sustainable Communities to feedback uh, the CODA's response to the Scottish Government by the, the 23rd of October and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Lorraine. Uh, Councillor Murray. Uh, thanks, <clears throat> Chair. Just to say thank you very much for the report. Uh, it's a very informative report. And just to say thanks to uh, Mrs. Graham for all the work she does in this area. Uh, she's very helpful uh, in, in terms of questions I ask her as well, uh, ward questions. So thank you very much for the report. Thanks. Okay. Much, Councillor Murray. Councillor Henry. Hello. Did, sorry, was it me or speaking to Jim? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I I can see the point, and and uh, uh, I would thank you for the report. Um, there's, I would say, um, obviously we. We're not against homeless people, obviously, and we don't have a big uh, problem here, but there are problems elsewhere. Uh, and we've been talking during uh, this meeting about um, the pressures on housing and so forth, uh, whether it be um, private, social, shared equity, rented, people uh, coming into the island, so on, so on. Um, uh, and ironically, COVID seems to be driving people to the islands, allegedly, anyway. Um, um, people are moving from other local authorities uh, to rent and all this sort of stuff. Uh, if there's no local connection um, uh, and it applies to homelessness, uh, it can have a sig significant effect, as Lorraine says, on resources. And I, I wonder if, you know, that's opening, uh, you know, a... a Problems for us in the future if if we if we just accept it as it is. The other thing is, and I wouldn't want it to affect that. Um, we've had um, uh, refugees coming into to the, the local authority area, uh, which is a good thing. Um, I don't know whether they're considered homeless um, or or what the, do they have a special status. Um, I don't know what the situation is there. Um, I'm just a wee bit... Uh, I know Lorraine says that, that we don't uh, have many, many cases of this and it probably in the long term won't affect us. But I just wouldn't want to see 
the floodgates open for, you know, everybody coming to the islands for whatever reason. Um, um, and I don't include the refugees in, in that context. Thank you, Councillor Mackenzie. Lorraine, you know? It's just to clarify, refugees do have special status, so they don't come under um, local connection rules at present. Um, with regard to um, the idea that we're going to be flooded, I think every local authority is of a similar view um, based on the previous consultation last year. The city authorities felt that everybody was going to flood to them. The rural authorities thought everyone was going to flood to them. Um, obviously, everybody can't be flooding everywhere, but our concern is, is just the impact for small rural authorities authorities and islands because we do not have the specialist services required to meet some of those who would come to our island. So, so that's our distinct issue as opposed to the issues for some of the more urban authorities. So on that basis, Chairman, um, you know, if, if, if that is a, a problem, I mean, how are we going to address that? That's in the, the recommendation to the court for the directed communities to respond on behalf of the coroner. Yeah, but what's the, what the response on that particular issue? Directed. So I think, Chair, we're just going to have to take each case on its merits and uh, deal with each case as it arrives. Uh, like Lorraine said, the worry is a small number uh, of households with very, very specialist needs. Uh, all we can do is work with our partner agencies to try and uh, meet these specialist needs. But if the people have arrived with these needs, we have to deal with it. Thank you. And Lorraine, were you want to come back in? Yeah, just, just to say that the, the government are considering that there may be um, a need for some areas for a local connection to be reintroduced if there is a significant impact in those areas. So we'll, we will be asking that one of the factors that they look at in considering um, how they will monitor what's going on in, in each local authority is the impact for us resource-wise, because at present they're very much just focusing on numbers rather than what's going on underneath those numbers with regard to resources. Thank you very much. Yeah, Chairman, that, I, I, you know, I think compassion should obviously come into this, um, but I, I'm just not sure what the director is saying. We, we do it on, on a case of um, case by case, but at the same time, we're, we're accepting, we're accepting what? <laughs> you know, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I said I'm still an open, an open book as far as as far as our response is concerned. We can so for him, Kai Leader, for you want to come in? Yeah, I just, I mean, on the, I think the local connection provision, the local connection issue is is sort of crucial for us. I mean, it's really really important that we have that lever. Um, what Lorraine is talking about there is uh, there there can be a disproportionate effect on our community of one or two cases that had high cost and high resource. I mean, a really, a really disproportionate effect. And so I think um, the danger with a case by case basis is by the time it's landed on your door, uh, the case begins costing you money right away. Um, and whatever solution you come to, it'll cost you money one way or another. So I think uh, local connection is really, really crucial that we are still able to deploy that the other thing I think we should maybe be highlighting in the response is uh, going back to the Island Act and saying, you know, and there's a disproportionate effect here of this legislation. It's got a bigger impact on islands and rural communities than, than in uh, larger areas. And we simply don't have the resources. So if we don't generally have the resources to cope with one or two difficult or challenging cases, let us have tools to avoid us getting involved in that situation in the first place. So give us a local connection uh, tool to use and also let us have some difference of approach and difference of response on the back of the fact that you do an island's impact assessment and the disproportionate effect that it can have here. So I think that we need to be quite forceful in a response around that. Yes, the island proving element is going to be important in the response. To the director's taking these comments on board. Uh, Councillor Nicholson, are you want to come in? Uh, 
Thank you, Chair. Tot totally agree uh, with the leader in the comments that uh, he's made. I would just add one point to it, uh, Chair. Uh, can we engage with our MSP to take forward uh, the concerns we have and the information from the good uh, report that's uh, provided uh, by Lorraine that's going back to Scottish Government. I would ask that uh, uh, we engage with our MSP to take forward our concerns, including the Island Act, the local connection and the impact uh, that uh, groups like that coming on the island would have on uh, the different services that we have. So can we have that, Chair, please? Director, can you have that? We can engage with the MSP. We engage with the MSP regularly on a number of issues and we'll take this issue up with them as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor McKenzie, your hand's still up. Will you want to come back in? Or... No. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, do members agree to the recommendation at 3.1? There's no hands up, so agreed. Uh, next item is housing options. This report is for noting and provides an update on the housing options and homelessness issues covering the year 2019-2020. And again, Lorraine will speak to the report and answer any questions. And thanks again, Chair. Um, well, in many ways, this report feels like a historical document now because 1920 seems very, very long ago and so much has changed since then. Um, so I, I, I won't speak too much to the report um, other than to say that we were making progress with our rapid rehousing transition plan, particularly with an increase in allocations being made, although there has been an ongoing uh, pressure on one and four bedroomed properties. And particularly on the Stornoway area, there remains a real pressure um, for housing demand uh, amongst the homeless community. Um, obviously, things have changed um, with the RRTP. It feels a bit like rip it up and start again. Um, we are preparing a second iteration for the, the Scottish Government by the end of this year, where we will have to review our position based on how um, COVID-19 has changed things. Um, it's still hard to say for sure what the ongoing impact is going to be on homelessness, but we do expect an increase in particular because numbers have remained at average levels throughout the last six months. But that has largely been because there have been no notice to quit or evictions for those six months. The Scottish Government um, put legislation out to prevent that from happening and have now extended that for a further six months. So we do unfortunately anticipate an increase because of um, potential increases in unemployment, debt and um, just the, the knock-on effect with relationship breakdown and stresses and pressures that people are under. So happy again to take any questions. Thank you, Lorraine. Any questions from members? Uh, Councillor Callum McLean. Yeah, first of all, can I thank Lorraine for this very comprehensive uh, report? Uh, and it's it's one of these reports that's readable, actually, uh, although uh, it's it, it's long and, and what have you, but well done. I, I say to you and your team, and well done for you and your team, the work you're do doing with homeless as well. I was at the seminar with Housing First, and, uh, and it's amazing the stuff they're doing. you're doing. Uh, first of all, I, I see in 5.1, you've got a homelessness applications, and in it, you're, you're, there's, consist, there's 179 adults and 72 children. Uh, and as you say, there's an increase, 7% increase of, of, from last year. Uh, I see in another part of the report that you've on, you've managed. Am I right to say that you've managed to to find houses for most of these and most of the children? Is that that's the first question? First of all, Lorraine. That's for the children in particular. Have these children have the have the homes been found for them? It, the, there's always a, a backlog of cases on our waiting list, so there's a throughput of households. So I can't say for sure that all of these 72 children have been permanently housed. There may still be some in the waiting list, but certainly um, those waiting for two and three bedroom properties who will be households with children, they move much faster through the system than those waiting for one bedroom or um, four bedroom <coughs> houses where there is a lot of pressure because there aren't so many properties available. So the majority of these children will have been housed, yes. 
The other question I have, one, one of the, the, the mention was made at the seminar was that consultation with HHP in the building of new houses, for instance, we've got new houses going up in Mackenzie Park and now in Blackwater or what have you. Is there still, and you're saying that, that there is going to be a real pressure in the Stornoway area, and, and, and alas, we are going to see that with, with the coming as the results of the lockdown and COVID-19. We're going to obviously see an increase more than likely in homelessness applications. Have you worked along, alongside HHP in ensuring, one of the things that we tried to ensure, to speak about at that seminar was the, the, the need to, to speak with HHP and with the local authority to ensure that in these developments there were enough houses within there or some of these houses would be for homeless uh, uh, people. Have you been working alongside HHP in that in the last week while? Yes, we, we continue to have discussions with HHP and they've actually been very helpful in increasing the initial proportion of allocations to homeless following lockdown in order to try and clear some of our backlog that we had in temporary accommodation. So we have ongoing conversations with them and as the, the RRTP is reviewed, we will be in discussions with them about the proportion of allocations that we will need in order to meet the Scottish Government's expectations to rapidly rehouse homeless households in our climate where homelessness is likely to be increasing. So discussions are ongoing, but there will be a bit of negotiation required. At the moment, they allocate 50% of, or they aim to allocate 50% of all um, allocations in the Stornoway area to homeless households. That realistically may need to increase in order to meet the RRT requirement. Good, good. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions, comments? See no hands up. So, uh, do members agree to note the report? No hands up comments, so noted. Uh, thank you very much, Lorraine. So, item nine um, apologies have been received from Gavin Hammond as he has had to go to the mainland on business. So, this item will now be reported to the December meeting. And that moves us on to item 10 report outstanding. And that's for noting. There's no comments. So, with that, we'll bring the meeting to a close. The next scheduled meeting of the committee will be on Tuesday, the 1st of December 2020. And I'd just like to say thank you for bearing with me. Like I say, sharing from the living room in the South US was a bit unexpected today. I didn't make it a top of Haval like Mr. Burr did, but pretty far away. So thank you very much. We'll see you later, guys. Thank you, Chair.